moment, this time of worshiping together of Steinbeck United Church and Niverville United Church and, and all those. So we say welcome. We say welcome to those from Niverville, those from Steinbeck and all of you who have just chosen to make this your time of worship this day. We are excited to worship in this way. We have had a wonderful time creating and working together. Neverville and Steinbeck to create this time of worship. Thanks for joining us. The land we are on, both here in Steinbeck and in Neverville, is Treaty 1 land, traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Swampy Cree, and Ojibwe people, homeland of the Métis Nation and of settlers. And we, we recognize and respect this spirituality and ways of knowing that have existed here for generations before us. We are called today to build a new relationship built on trust and respect, one that creates peace and friendship. So as we gather on this day, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from, who you love, or where you are on your faith journey. Know that you are a beloved child of God. You belong here. You are welcome here. This is the first Sunday of Epiphany, the season when light and wisdom break through the darkness. And so, as we light this Christ candle, the symbol of the sacred and of love in our midst. We know that we are not alone. We see the light and feel the presence of the sacred, of each other, and of all of creation. Let us worship together. Welcome to the first shared online worship linking the hearts of the good folk of Steinbeck United with the good hearts of the folk at Niverville United. My name is Bill Miller, and my role at Niverville is 
pretty much the same as Paul Duvall's role at Steinbeck. And this worship series has been and is being planned by a small group of people from each of the two congregations. Project Epiphany, we're calling it. Epiphany means light coming or light revealing. And that's what we're hoping to do, simply to be open to the light, to be open to the possibilities that God might be inviting our two communities to cooperate somehow, connect at a deeper level. In this service, this morning, we'll end up looking at the beginning of the Bible, so let's begin by words from the end of it, from the book of Revelation. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Behold, God's home is with people. God will dwell with them. They will be God's own people, and God will be their own God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor grief, nor crying, nor hurt. For all these things will have passed away. And the one sitting on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Let's pray. No more crying. No more dying. No more of the hurt we carry. All things made new. Not restoration to what was, but the creation of something new. When all that has limited us in the past limits us no longer. We hold on to this promise, God, as a rider hold the rain, holds the reins of a horse or the shipwrecked hold whatever floats. We hold on to you, our only true hope, our only reliable source of courage and compassion and clarity. You are our God and we are your people. We trust you. Amen. mystery and wonder and awe. This story is about an epiphany, a moment when the light shone through the darkness, when it burst into being. But this story took billions and billions and billions of years to happen. Now, how do I start? 
Once upon a time. Mm, no, that doesn't work. Long, long ago. No, that one doesn't work either. Maybe. In the beginning. In the beginning. The Ojibwe's tell this story, and theirs begins with nothing, because in the beginning there was nothing. There was nothing but an all-consuming dark void. Nothing, that is, except possibility. Hmm. The stories from the Bible about this start the very same way. In the beginning, there was nothing. There was no up or down, or near or far, no yesterday or today, only God. Here, now. Then came the idea. Maybe that was the same as the possibility. <clears throat> the idea came from God and was part of God, yet it seemed to have a life of its own. From that idea, all things came into being, light and darkness, time and space, energy and matter, everything needed to make a universe. God gathered them together. Out of swirling gas clouds, fiery stars ignited with a whoosh. Planets and moons spun together and galaxy danced like snowflakes on a winter night. It must have been wonderful, dreaming and imagining, making all those things that had never been made before. God could see that it was good. The idea kept growing. And God said, let there be a sky above and water below. And it rained and rained and rained. And God said, let the water come together in the hollow places so there can be dry ground. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God said, that's good. Then God said, let there be plants, green plants, beautiful flowers of every color, daffodils and dandelions and tulips and roses, all the colors and all the flowers of the earth. And fruit trees, fruit trees, every kind on earth, and, and make them all have seeds and fruit so that there will always be more trees and more fruit. And God said, hmm, that's good. And then God said, let there be lights in the sky to separate the day from the night, the light from the darkness. And God made two great lights, the sun to shine during the daytime and the moon, the silver moon to shine at night. And God said, that's good. And then God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. So God created the great sea monsters and the shiny, slimy fish and the, and the seahorses and the starfish and the shells. And then God said, hmm, let there be beautiful, colorful birds that fly in the sky. The meadowlarks and the robins and the crows and the sparrows. And let the fish have baby fish, and let the birds have baby birds, so that when the old ones die, there will always be new ones. And God said, that's good. 
And God said, let there be animals that live on the earth, living creatures of every kind, cattle and creepy crawly things, and giraffe and wild animals and monkeys. And it was so. And God said, that's good. God looked at everything with delight. And you know how it is when you're making something. You picture it in your mind, but sometimes your own creation can surprise you. God enjoyed every bit of it, day and night, light and dark, land and sea, sky and earth, sun and moon. Maybe God even laughed out loud at the sight of the dolphins jumping, leaping out of the water, or the birds doing funny dances to attract each other. This is too good to keep to myself, thought God. So God made another kind of living creature, one even more like God than all the others. This living thing could love, laugh, delight in beautiful beauty, think, imagine, dream, wonder, choose, maybe even have ideas of its own. And God said, that's good. And he looked at the creature and he said, take care of my creation, be kind to it. When God was finished, it was time to rest. Glad to be part of such a wonderful world, the new creature rested too. From the message, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. First, this. God created the heavens and earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day and named the dark night. It was evening. It was morning, day one. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is Mark 1, verses 1 to 11. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It began as the prophet Isaiah had written. God said, I will send my messenger ahead of you to open the way for you. Someone is shouting in the desert. Get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. So John appeared in the desert, baptizing and preaching. Turn away from your sins and be baptized, he told the people, and God will give your, forgive your sins. Many people from the province of Judea and the city of Jerusalem went out to hear John. They confessed their sins and he baptized them in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. He announced to the people, the man who will come after me is much greater than I am. I am not good enough even to bend down and untie his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. No long, no, not long after Jesus came from Nazareth in the province of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw heaven opening and the Spirit come down on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my dear son, my own dear son, I am pleased with you. I don't know about you, but by nature, I'm, I'm an optimist, pathologically so, if you listen to my family. And I think maybe that's why it's been so hard for me to enter this new year aching like this, hurting inside, and I can't seem to get rid of it. 
there's just been, it feels like too much pain, too much heartbreak, so much confusion, and, and this ongoing feeling of sense of disequilibrium, of not quite knowing how or what to do. Ah, such a time. Time. You know, the Greeks had two words for, for time. Chronos, which is chronological time, you know, clock time, moves forward like that. And kairos, which is the right time, the purposeful time, meaningful time. Have you had those kind of moments? It might be maybe when you fell in love or, or some significant turning. I remember, I remember I had a moment like that. I didn't recognize it at first. See, when my daughter, my oldest daughter was an infant, my wife's dad wasn't very well. and We were up at the lake at her family place and it's on an island and there's no electricity and there's one cottage and it's got a couple of stories and then then another cottage well, about 20 minutes away down a path anyway so her dad wasn't well and they were sleeping below us and we were in the unit above and Kristen started crying in the middle of the night so i i thought well i'll take her over to the other cabin so i put her into my backpack and grabbed my little flashlight and I headed off down the path it was overcast that night and then halfway down the path the flashlight just totally stopped, conked out. And and you couldn't see anything, couldn't see a hand in front of my face. And I, I had this moment of fear, and then what do you do? So I thought, well, I'll just kind of kneel down here and take the flashlight apart and try to make some kind of reconnection inside and then put it back together. And it worked. There was light. We moved from Kronos to Kairos, but I didn't know it quite then. I didn't understand it. You know, another word for that kind of a time is liminal. Liminal comes from the, uh, from the Latin word liminus, which means doorway. And when you're in the doorway, are you inside or are you outside? Well, you're neither. It's a space that's in between. And that space is, people who have studied what happens in that space find it's incredibly creative. It's a high a time of high creativity when all kinds of things become possible. You know, I think we're in that kind of a liminal time right now. In this exploration that we're doing here at Steinbach and Neverville, but also in the whole of the church as we start to envision what kind of a church are we going to be in this post-COVID world? Because the world that will emerge after COVID will not be the same as it was before. There will be no returning to what was. It'll be like my mom's generation in 1945. They didn't return to the 1930s. They re-emerged, emerged into something new. And I think that's what it will be for us. And so it begins, this wandering, wandering together. And today it begins with two stories. The unflowery, straight-ahead, practical, pragmatic Mark. And the other, the totally poetic, imaginative, mystical story from Genesis. So let's start with poetic. Now, the Hebrew text is filled with all these words and images that are somewhat hard to convey in English. To describe this place, or well, non-place, or this time, or non-time. Before God speaks, before creation. Barbara Brown Taylor once said, in the moments before a word is spoken, anything is possible. In the beginning, God began to create. In the beginning, when God began to create, the spirit, which is ruach, breath or wind, was, and then the word is hovering, rachaf, which really means to become soft, relaxed. So the idea is gently moving, like sauntering if she was walking, except there was nothing to walk on. So she was gently moving over what? Well, 
the Tehom, it says. Now that's the abyss, the deep sea. This was a terrifying place for the ancients, all swirling and unknown. And over the abyss, Koshek. Now, that means darkness or obscurity or even distress. And then it says, formless and void was the earth. Now, that's a pun. The Hebrews love puns. There's lots of word plays in the Bible. And it, what it says is, uh, it was all bohu and tohu. Now, bohu means empty, nada, nothing. Tohu is translated as formless, but it also means confusing, chaotic, meaningless, futile. Ah, can you get a feeling for what's being described then? Uncertain, distressing, confusing, dark. It was that moment in the woods with my infant daughter when time is somehow suspended. There is no time. And so it begins. God says light, and light happens. It begins, that's the first phrase really in the Bible. It begins, this creation story, our story. Now, quickly, let's look over at Mark, the, the pragmatist. And his story too begins with, it begins. And where does it begin? In the Eremos. Now that gets translated the wilderness, the desert. But haremos in Greek really means lonely, solitary, isolated, cut off, abandoned, God-forsaken place. And immediately, who do we meet? Oh, we meet this wild character, this Sasquatch-like person, John the Baptist. And what does he call us to do? Something very dangerous to become very vulnerable, to confess that we need God. That brings to mind a, a quote from Douglas Coupland, the Canadian author. He writes at one point, now here is my secret. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. My secret is that I need God. I am sick and can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem to be beyond being able to love. So here's this character. And then to add to the confusion, Jesus, the one who would seem to not need to be baptized, is baptized. A kind of identification with all of us who do need that. All who are vulnerable. Okay, so two beginning stories with these oddly similar contexts. Now, we're in the story. And you know, that's always a, a key question whenever we look at any scriptural passage. Where are we in the story? Well, we're in this story. And we're in it now, for we too are in this strange liminal time, this kairos moment before God speaks and creates. If you check, we seem to have all the required elements. The darkness, the distress. Hmm. What about that required sense of emptiness, confusion, uncertainty, even maybe a feeling of futility or meaninglessness? Hmm. Ah. That means we have what we need for light to happen. Mark tells us that we need to begin by personally entering the Eremos, that lonely, isolated place, that cutoff place. I think we're there. And there, by grace, we can encounter this odd stranger who calls us to recognize our own deep secret, that we too need God that we can't do it alone. The elements seem to be all in place. If, as I suspect we are, we are uncomfortable enough, you know, it's an interesting word, comfort. It comes originally from strong together, come forth. 
And it's one of the biblical names for the spirit, the parakletos, the one who brings comfort. So this comfort is the necessary prerequisite for the spirit, the parakletos, the one who brings comfort. This ease is the necessary prerequisite for healing. You know, pain, discomfort. Uh, in long ago, in intercultural work, they talked about disconfirmed expectancies. Well, funny term, but what it means is you expect something to happen, but it doesn't happen. And when that continues for a period of time, we get all this confusion and disequilibrium. Well, that sense of discomfort, that's not the evidence of being forsaken. It's the evidence of being ready. Pain is a part of that. You know, I broke my nose, and the do nose doctor at one point, you know, that's not his formal title, nose doctor. Anyways, the nose doctor uh, says, oh, would you like me to realign it? Well, um, it hurt. And afterwards, I said, yeah, well, that hurts. And he said, basically, yeah, it's only pain. It's only pain. If you're experiencing some chaos and discomfort, maybe even some pain in your home life, your intimate circles, that's not a sign that as Tom Waits sang, God's away on business. It's a sign that the conditions are right for some kind of new creation in your, in your own inner circle, that place of intimacy and vulnerability where you live, that circle that surrounds you. What would it be like for you, for us, to re-envision our discomfort, our uncertainty as a kind of a doorway place, the precondition necessary before something new happens? You know, for our churches too. That great return that we look for when we can hug each other and we can be together and we can even smell that person who puts on too much fragrance, Ah, it's going to be wonderful. But it's not really a return. It will be more like 1945. We are not returning to what was, but emerging into something new. A new creation. God is on the move. Leonard Cohen's song, God is alive, magic is afoot. It's all God is afoot. God, God there is some kind of weird magic that happens in these moments. There's something when it breaks open, if we're ready. It seldom, maybe never, unfolds the way we expect. Watch for the unexpected. Let's pray. Okay, God. We seem to have all the discomfort we maybe need. You know better than us. But we're ready. We're ready for this new thing, for whatever it is that you are dreaming, because we know that in your dreaming we become alive, that in your heart and in your loving we become alive and we become the people you want us to be. And so we hold on to you. You are our source of all hope. Carry us forward. We trust you. Amen.
actually not, not the most spiritual of people. And, and sometimes I think the best thing I've been to God is handy. But you know what? That's not a bad thing. In fact, maybe simply being available is the very best thing that any of us can offer. So in these strange days when we try to figure out how to do offering and yet we're on this online community, maybe that's something we can offer. Just ourselves, our availability, our moments, our time. Let's pray. God, we're available. I'm available. Use us in whatever way you want. We give you our minds, our hearts, our circle of relationships, our time, our confusion and our clarity, our strengths and our weaknesses, all that big mix of things that is us. We're yours. Do good with us. We make ourselves available to you in all the ways we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's join. We'll sing, I'm going to live so God can use me. from West Bengal, India, went missing from her family home just a few months ago. Struggling to survive, Lakshmi was trafficked by her aunt, who promised that she could earn money and become independent by dancing. Thankfully, Lakshmi's parents contacted the Diocese of Durgapur, which runs an anti-human trafficking program supported by the Mission and Service Gifts. The Diocese intervened, and on the threat of legal action, Lakshmi's aunt returned her to her parents. Human trafficking is a burgeoning crisis in India, where non-government organizations estimate that 20 to 65 million people, especially women and girls, are exploited. Girls like Lakshmi are typically trafficked to be sexually exploited or forced into marriage, but they are also trafficked for labor and even for organ harvesting. Sometimes their own families traffic them. Other times, girls are taken by complete strangers who often hunt for victims in places where it's easy to poach them. Around the world, human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises because it is relatively low risk and has a high profit potential. That's because unlike drugs, the humans can be sold repeatedly. The pandemic has made the problem even worse, especially in parts of the world where the economy is suffering because of the COVID-19 crisis. The pandemic, pandemic has had many per, repercussions in India. Migrant laborers all over India have lost their jobs and many have died trying to reach home for the lockdown. The economy took a hit with the largest drop in GDP of 23.9%. Every time India faces a crisis, there is a rise in trafficking in the country, explains Raja Moses, a program coordinator with the Diocese of Durgapur. Your gifts through mission and service are making a difference. In partnership with the Diocese of Durgapur, your support helps the anti-trafficking unit find and free women and children who are being trafficked. Once they are freed, your gifts help victims seek justice for what they have been through and regain a sense of worth and acceptance. Your generosity is also preventative, helping provide the education that is needed to offer protection against predators. With your help, young women like Lakshmi have a second chance at freedom. Families like hers can get their children back safely. Now more than ever, the world needs your generosity. Thank you for your gifts through mission and service. Some of you might be familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian uh, who was arrested and ultimately killed um, for participating in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. When he was in prison, 
Christmas in 1943, he wrote a letter because he was worried about his family, the people that he loved. And in that letter, he wrote that we need to commend other people wholly and unreservedly to God and leave them in God's hands, transforming our anxiety for them into prayers on their behalf. Beautiful words. So let's, let's do that. Unfathomable God, God beyond time, God before the beginning, God after the end, our minds cannot grasp you. Yet somewhere deep inside us, though we are but stardust filled with breath, some part of us understands, knows that we are your children, that that ancient story of you breathing your breath into us reflects this deep understanding that you are as close to us as our own breathing. We fret, we worry, because we cannot see beyond the present moment. All this fretting and worry can make us selfish, as if self-absorption was true self-reliance. Set us free so we can lift our eyes from our worries for a moment, just long enough to see you, long enough to raise these concerns that we carry and hand them to you. In each of our communities, God, some of us are badly wounded. They need your healing. Some are heartbroken. They need your compassion. Some are anxious, afraid. They need your courage. Some are lonely. They need your close companionship. Oh God, you are our God, our only God, our our holy hope, our only reliable supply of courage and compassion and clarity. And so we pray. We pray for ourselves, yes, for we are often in short supply of these. But even more heartily, we pray for those we love, those whose well-being right now is uncertain, though the ones we carry in our souls and in our minds and in our hearts. And in the silence now, we name them before you. We love these people, and so we entrust them wholly and unreservedly into your hands. We entrust each other into those same hands. We entrust ourselves into those same hands as well. Amen. Now we get to go forward with our living. You know, there's no guarantees about this year. It could be even more difficult. We hope it's not. But there's no promises that way. 
There is this promise, however, that no matter what may come, no matter what we are called upon to face, we do not need to face it alone. We face it held in the arms of the living God. We face it with the parakletos, the one who is our comforter, being with us even in our times of great discomfort. We walk forward knowing we have the blessing of the living God, of Jesus the Christ and the Holy Spirit with us, and none of that depends on how good or spiritual or smart we are. You have it because these are your gifts to us. And so go forward into your lives. Live with courage, with faith, with conviction. God will be with you. You will never be alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.